Welcome, everybody. We've had this special briefing on the books for a while, but last week it took on added significance when Mayor Adams officially named Laura Cavanaugh, Commissioner of the FDNY, the first woman to lead the department in its 157-year history. There won't be a learning curve for our new commissioner. She's been running the 17,000-person department on interim basis since February, and she's distinguished herself for being quick, decisive, and cool under fire. Now, we all know the FDNY is a storied place, and part of that story is known as a place of lifetimers, often multi-generational lifetimers. The fact that the commissioner has risen to where she is since joining the FDNY's leadership in 2014 tells you a lot about Laura Cavanaugh's character and capabilities. I should also say that she has worked to make this trajectory possible for other women, as well as the underrepresented, the underrepresented by leading a recruitment campaign that generated more diverse applicants in the department's history. In her time with the FDNY, Commissioner Kavanaugh has seen this city through a lot. She's credited with helping lead the agency's response to Ebola in 2015, and more recently to COVID in 2020, when so many of our FDNY and EMS workers are on the front lines. During her swearing in, Commissioner commented that she has lived in every borough in the city and said, I quote, the city is the love of my life and I am relentlessly optimistic about its future. Now we got to mostly see the commissioner of the FDNY in the toughest moments of the city, just as we see firefighters and EMTs during our toughest personal moments as New Yorkers. Commissioner, I wanna say we at Abney understand the depth of our debt to you and the, to the department. We share your enthusiasm for the city and we wanna be here to help you and really just to tell you how appreciative we are um, for all that you do. So congratulations on your appointment. Welcome to Abney. I'm going to turn the webinar and the Zoom over to you. That was very kind. Um, uh, thank you so much. I couldn't ask for a better introduction. And certainly, you know, my devotion uh, to the men and women of the New York City Fire Department is total. And really, um, I, I want to thank them for everything they do. Um, so thank you for having me. Thank you for, you know, speaking about our members and what they do. Thank you for speaking about my city. Um, I meant that from the bottom of my heart. It is the love of my life. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time in a lot of communities um, and every borough. So I am, you know, truly honored to be here and certainly to be working with a group of people who I think, you know, like myself, like Mayor Adams, you know, really have a passion and a dedication to bringing our city to the next phase, right? I don't know if we're saying post pandemic, but certainly what we have been through with COVID has been a, you know, uh, the fire department and the uh, city of New York have in common, which is that, you know, we have been through some very dark moments, but we have always found a way to come back and we have always come back stronger. So I am certain that that is what we are going to do here. So with that, I am, would, would like to dive a little bit into the weeds of uh, our Bureau of Fire Prevention and permitting and how we are thinking about that, if it is okay with you. All right, I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Yes, please. Yes. Okay, I wanna make sure you guys can hear me too, so. <laughs> yes, you've okay. it out there for about five, 10 seconds, but, but all good, thank you. Okay, um, so, you know, the, Bureau of Fire Prevention, as many of your members know, deals with the permitting part of the FDNY, in which the mission is to ensure the safety of, of New Yorkers and the safety of um, you know, the buildings that we all live and work in every day. And like many things during COVID, that unit was hit uh, especially hard. They lost a number of members, and um, they also had to rededicate resources to a number of other functions that are not part of their core business process. Um, so when I stepped into the acting role, it was one of the first places I looked at because I knew that, you know, as we had to come back as a city, that this would be incredibly important. I also knew that, you know, because of what they had gone through, they would both need the support and it would also be an opportunity to review some of uh, what we were doing and see how we could do it more efficiently and more effectively. And that is, you know, really what we have done here in this specific bureau and you know, is really the philosophy I bring to management, which is always to just step back, take an outside look and say, could we do this better? You know, could the technology, 
uh, that have come across in the last few years help us do our job uh, more easily. I also come from an extremely um, community-based, customer-centric point of view in everything that I do. And so one of the first things I did was start talking to the business community about where their pain points were with this bureau um, and how we could find a way to work through them together. And I, I believe that you know you can be both efficient and you can be safe. Those things can work uh, hand in hand. And so that's what we've done here. So I'm gonna roll through a couple of the changes uh, in three areas, uh, leadership and management of the bureau, customer service and our approach to it, and then technology and innovation. And I will try not to talk, speak too long so that your members can jump in and ask questions. Um, so on the first part on leadership and management, um, we have done two things that I think are really key. One, we have gone and looked for forward-looking leaders with technology experience and customer service experience specifically, um, especially as I mentioned, this bureau has been down a number of positions through COVID as we have worked to backfill those positions, which is a key part of making sure that this unit is up and running. We've also looked for folks who are gonna have that same point of view of you know, speaking to the community and also thinking outside of the box about how we can do our existing work better, faster, and more efficient. And I have some, I think, great news on that front and you know, a little bit of proof that this has already borne fruit, which is that we have re reduced plan exam processing times from 22 weeks to six weeks. And I know that's a major pain point for a number of your members. And we have reduced inspection turnaround time from 12 weeks to six weeks. I think you have that up there on your screen as well. So, you know, we expect that to only get better. Um, Mayor Adams has given us all of the resources that we need to get this done. And as we've implemented it, we've continued to see these processing times speed up. And we think that as this goes, it's only going to build on its ex existing success. You know, the more uh, technology and automation that we have, the more people that we have in the unit looking at it. Um, from the customer point of view, the more we think we're going to see those wait times and those processing times go down. So that's one part, the leadership and management of the Bureau. The second part, as I've already mentioned a few times, is customer service. Um, it is incredibly important to me specifically, and I've made that clear for everybody that I work with, that customer service is at the heart of everything we do. It is already at the heart of everything we do for fire and EMS, and it should be no different when it comes to fire prevention. Um, so I have done a lot of outreach. I've sat down with any number of people. I'm sure many of them are here and I will, even if uh, I'm probably setting myself up for a lot of meetings, offer it to anyone on here. Uh, my door is always open to get feedback. Um, and we have done a whole bunch of that in my, my early months here. And we plan to do more of it to hear what people need, but also to keep an ongoing dialogue. And one of the things we heard most often is that it was just often unclear to people what was next. Um, you know, if there was a delay, it sometimes was on the side of maybe a consultant that they had hired, but they weren't sure how to move it forward because there wasn't someone they could simply pick up the phone and say, for this important project, what is it that I need to do to move it forward? Um, and they were often waiting weeks for that feedback. And so we have set up um, a customer service bureau um, that specifically does no. that. No, sorry. So it's just a lot. It's just. Yeah. Maybe we got some background noise. Um, so, you know, we've set up a customer service bureau whose job it is to be at the other end of a phone and an email to walk people through exactly what the process is from start to finish, no matter what they're coming to us for, so that they don't get halfway through the process or at the end of the process and find out something new that they didn't know. Um, and so that they always have someone who can say, you know, this is where my application is, this is what needs to be done to move it forward. And here are some of the hurdles that you're going to have to overcome in order to get approval. Um, the person that we had doing that has tremendous experience. Um, he had actually worked on um, opening pre-Ks in the past administration. And so he is somebody who is a proven cross-agency leader. Um, he is always reaching out to the other agencies, ensuring that you know, it's not just that, are we telling you what you need from us, but if it needs to work in conjunction with another agency, um, to, can we tell you that as well? And I'm sure many, many members on this have had the experience of having one agency say, you're good here, but you have to talk to the other agency. And then the other agency says the same thing. 
Um, it is uh, our belief and our you know, shared belief, certainly with the mayor, that silos should not exist like that. Um, and so we've brought on somebody to work on customer service who shares that belief, who actually has a proven track record of working with other agencies to make sure that the city of New York is letting you know what you need to do to move forward. Um, and he's building out a group of customer service agents to do just that. And that will continue to grow. And there will be real um, personal customer service for anybody that comes to the Bureau of Fire Prevention with any need. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's data and technology. You know, it's 2022. This is the uh, biggest and best fire department in the world. And we should have at our fingertips everything we need to do our job more efficiently. And so we um, looked at our process from start to finish. We looked at every single step. We looked at how we could eliminate redundancies, how we could share information with our fellow agencies, share data that would help us all anticipate better where our workload was and actually put aside inspectional time so that by the time you come to ask for an inspection, um, we are ready and actually have open slots for people. And so that has been um, a really intensive uh, you know, look, review that we've done We've implemented a lot of new technology, and then there's some new technology that we are going to be implementing uh, that will really ensure that there are as few um, additional steps in the process and that the agencies themselves are sharing data between one another that help us uh, better serve you and your members. Um, and that includes uh, the, the FIRES portal, which I know uh, many of you have known about for years and you know is really a place where you could log in yourself and actually see what's going on with your projects. Um, and then finally, you know, we're running a data-driven operation. So now that we've looked at everything and made our process more efficient, we are also building dashboards so that we as managers every day can look to them and understand which direction are we trending? Where are our pain points? How can we get ahead of them before the industry needs to come and tell us? How can we understand where the delays are? Um, and so we are moving to a totally data-driven um, management of the Bureau of Fire, Bureau of Fire Prevention. Um, so with that, I will pause and uh, open it up to you guys for questions. Perfect, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I guess, let me start by saying, we're all relieved that um, we're, let's say, moving into a new I don't want to say the pandemic is over, but however, whatever you want to say this new phase is. And in that relief, I think we hope there won't be more of these anytime soon. That said, it is your job to worry on all of our behalf um, to how one might respond to the next one. And can I ask, how are you thinking about that? And, and what does anything have to change for the FDMI in terms of resources or just what have you learned for when this happens? Oh, hopefully not, but maybe it happens again. Yeah, you know, the fire department is a place where we are um, always planning for the worst and hoping for the best, right? So we do a lot of training, a lot of exercises, and we had done so before this pandemic. We had a pandemic plan, um, and that really came into effect uh, when COVID hit. So we continue to do that. You know, we look five years out. We have done our own uh, review of what we learned during COVID and how that will, um, you know, alter our pandemic plans in the future. So, you know, I think that that's just already an organic part of the organization. Um, I think certainly, you know, some of the things that we've all, you know, we've all moved to the fact that we're all on Zoom doing this, you know, there are some things that will just stay as a result of COVID. I think that's very true in this agency as well. Um, certainly, you know, trying to communicate um, to our members more directly and via alternative means, um, you know, lots of technology and smartphones have rolled out into the field here at the FDNY um, in these in these years because of the pandemic. But now that we have them, um, they are a tool at our disposal to communicate to our members um, about any future disaster. So there are definitely a number of ways in which you know the pandemic has made us um, reflect and improve on operations. But I would also say we are always planning for the worst and that shouldn't scare anyone. That's our job. You know, we're always thinking about what could happen um, and trying to plan for it and be prepared for it. And we do a lot of exercises and, and practicing in tabletops to be ready for that. 
Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, Stephen and I, I think we'll tag team on the questions. Um, but uh, just to piggyback off of, you know, Stephen's uh, question regarding sort of changes as a result to sort of the pandemic and how to prepare for future uh, events and crises, you know, I, I will say I really appreciate sort of the description uh, of how the department is thinking about changing its ways and how it operates, whether it's using data, whether it is uh, the technology. Um, we know that the mayor is is uh, someone who really advocates for the use of technology in the administration of the city. Uh, Cross-agency coordination, extremely important. Um, expediting permits, right? So, you know, we really appreciate your assistance in pulling together a few of um, the chiefs to talk to some of our members uh, a little while ago regarding this issue. And I'd just like to follow up on that a little bit. Um, as you know, the Association for a Better New York is uh, partially made up of businesses um, that you know really are the economic generators of the city, and um, you know are situated and work in uh, developing high-rise commercial buildings. And like I said, a few of our members met with uh, Deputy Chief, hopefully soon Chief Tom Correo, to discuss um, the practical steps to amend or streamline the permitting processes around a lot of issues, but particularly the auxiliary radio communication systems, uh, which a lot of our members sort of experience frustration and being backlogged in approvals to hold up sort of the opening of um, buildings across the city. Would really love to hear uh, you talk a little bit about sort of the impact of the changing in regulations uh, and rules that uh, have been put in place much to your, your credit and your agency um, about the regulatory framework that you're putting in place to sort of expedite the permitting processes. But if you can talk a little bit about sort of uh, what impact you really see uh, this in terms of numbers across the city, I think that'll be helpful for a lot of the folks who are on the call this morning. Yeah, you know, I think that um, that uh, particular system, the auxiliary radio systems, is a really great example of why it is both so important to take a fresh look at things um, and why collaboration is so important. I, you know, I think what's really key about this administration is, you know, everyone always wants to collaborate and is something that you hear. It is a lot harder in, in practical reality because, you know, our agencies are large and certainly in the case of my agency, we are constantly responding to emergencies that we that pop up, right? And we can't anticipate. And so, you know, I think this administration has really, the big change is that, you know, we, they've really made sure we got at the table to look at these things because we do have both this fresh opportunity, but also a real need as we come into this next phase of the city. And I think that radio system is such a great example because that was something that, you know, whether it was 10 or 15 years ago when it had first been uh, a discussion, the technology was, different. And so the requirement that we had put in then was a requirement that we needed um, for the safety of our members. But a decade later, the technology has changed. And in fact, the system as we were requiring it, which was causing significant pain points for your members in terms of delays, when we looked at it, we realized we no longer needed it. Um, in fact, it was a bit of a, a hindrance to our operations, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that is a really great example of why it's so necessary to consistently look at these things and to look at them together and, to, you know, hear out our partners, um, because that is something that was good for us and good for you. And I think people often think that it's one or the other, and I really don't think for the most part it is. Um, it's not safety or economic development. It's safety and economic development. It just requires looking at it with a fresh point of view. Um, so I think, you know, one, that should be a great example for all of us going forward and, and to make us, you know, think it's possible for, for some who might say, you know, we've tried this before. Um, that is a perfect example where once some of your members raised it, we took a look at it, Chief Correo took a look at it and said, you know, this isn't working for us or them, let's change it. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, you will see, you know, certainly I can't imagine that that will be a significant pain point going forward because the change will mean there's far fewer applications that need to be made at all uh, through us. Um, and then that, you know, the stat that I cited at the beginning, well, that was for plan exams, um, not the auxiliary radio, but going from 22 weeks to six weeks, again, is another example of if we really are sit at the table and we really look at things, there are a lot of tools that, you know, 2022 offers us. And there are a lot of things that just, you know, over time may have been 
uh, a good idea or helpful a decade ago when they were first put in, but now they're redundant. You know, now technology allows multiple agencies to look at the same data at the same time, rather than to go from one agency to another, like a bouncing ball. And so, you know, I think that you will definitely see more of us, that from us, but I also think you raising these issues is why that's so key. You know, I don't think that that, that was not at the top of our list of concerns when we were reviewing what needed to be um, upgraded in fire prevention. It was your members bringing it and saying it was a pain point that caused us to look at it. And when we did, we realized it was a real operational issue for us and that we would, you know, we could find a way forward together. Thank you. And, and I love the point about and not or. Um, yes. We often think of things as one or the other, but it can be both. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, got a question from our Abney board member, Vinny Alvarez, uh, about traffic. Um, and I'm dying to talk to you about traffic. So <laughs> it makes the point. So we now have bike lanes, pedestrian plazas, sidewalk restaurants, and just the streetscapes more complicated when most of us are in traffic and late. It's aggravating when you're in traffic, it's life and death. Um, obviously, congestion pricing is on a bit, seems to be on a slower boat of sorts than that than, than it uh, had initially seemed. So can I ask you, like, how problematic is that? What's it doing to response times? And are there, do you, are there, like, ideas and plans that you give the city to say, like, this, this has to change in order for us to do our job well? Yeah, so traffic is an issue for us, as you can imagine, for anyone who sat in traffic in New York City lately, which is just about everybody at this point. Um, it is is definitely gotten worse, and that does have impacts on response times. You know, there's no way around that. And so, you know, a couple of things that we're doing, you know, one of uh, our chiefs is assigned specifically now to speak to um, the other agencies like DOT to understand, you know, where are where are their pain points? You know, where is the traffic the worst? You know, that's something we actually look at. We look at times of day, neighborhoods, days of the week um, to understand where the traffic patterns are sort of shifting. And I think that actually also has changed a little bit after COVID is where the traffic is uh, and why. And so we are one looking at that so that we can understand how we need to, um, you know, talk to our operations team about how to work around that to the extent it's possible. And then we are talking to other agencies like DOT to understand where things like bike lanes or sidewalk sheds, where we can be part of the conversation. Um, and especially, you know, as you go uh, lower down in Manhattan and the streets get smaller, it's a very different question when you add something to a street like that and you need to get, say, a fire truck or an ambulance down it than it is, um, you know, in Fifth Avenue. So we are having those conversations right now with them, um, again, to, you know, understand where the streetscape is going to be changing in this, you know, in the next couple of years. Can I ask, is the problem markedly more complicated in Manhattan than it is in other boroughs? Or is it sort of traffic is a pervasive problem that affects you everywhere? Uh, I would say traffic is a pervasive problem that affects us everywhere. I, I think that specific issue of narrow streets has always been an operational concern for um, our members in lower Manhattan. So it, ha it has its own uh, particular issues that we have to look at. Those are not just traffic. I mean, imagine the size of some of our apparatus and the size of some of those streets in lower Manhattan. Um, it is truly like one of the things I'm most impressed by the, the folks who drive our apparatus through those streets, even on a regular day, uh, let alone, you know, a traffic filled day or one with a bike lane. Um, but generally it's just, it is a, a all five boroughs issue. Is it an obvious question to ask if one has considered, since you mentioned the size of the apparatuses that are driven around that, like might smaller vehicles <laughs> also be a fact? I know the officers are on bicycles, I'm not saying you could put on bicycles, but is there a version long-term as technology makes things smaller that that's part of a solution? Um, yeah, we are always looking at that. And actually, if you go back a couple of years, there was a little bit of news on an a uh, slightly smaller ambulance that we had based in some really um, congested pedestrian areas. So Times Square was the one it was most known for. And that was the exact reason for it, which is in some of these areas, uh, in order to navigate, it was better to have a smaller ambulance that could get around, especially in a space where you know most people were on foot. Um, so we have already done that and are always looking, um, you know, we're always send, sending people out to conferences. We're always talking to our other fire departments uh, to find out, 
you know, what is coming up or what could we even ask for as, you know, the largest fire department in the country, often where we go, others follow. Um, so we're having those conversations all the time. Thank you. All right. Um, and just full transparency, you know, I hear about sort of driving those uh, vehicles through the streets of the Bronx all the time as my partner is a firefighter and he's a chauffeur. And I see how he drives his regular car and I can't imagine how he drives that vehicle. So God bless us all. But uh, <laughs> it's very impressive. I do hear about it every day, but thank you. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit. Um, there is a question from one of our board members, um, uh, Bob Lerman, uh, who asked about uh, the fire department's role in housing and affordable housing specifically. And this is a two-part question. Uh, one, I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the accidental deaths and sort of uh, the fires we've seen recently where um, homeowners have been killed um, and sort of uh, fire prevention. And we think about the neighborhoods, the communities of color uh, that are more likely to be harmed or killed by accidental fires. Um, you know, really interested, I think there was a fire over the weekend in the Bronx where there were some fatalities. Um, really interested in hearing about what proactive measures uh, the FDNY are working on to either educate or um, better inspect or work with developers or homeowners of affordable units or, you know, people have to be creative uh, to create affordable housing nowadays or living situations to live affordably. So really interested in learning more about what the FDNY is doing around that. And then related to affordability and workforce housing, you know, something that's really important for ABNY is making sure that our firefighters and our other working class New Yorkers are able to stay in the city and can afford some place to live. So really curious to hear about sort of what you're hearing amongst the ranks about, you know, uh, affordability of housing and staying in New York. I know these are two separate questions, but I want to throw them all out um, and want to know how we can help to advocate for the development of more housing for, say, firefighters so that we know that they can stay in our city. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So that was a lot. So I'll try to take it one by one. Um, you know, I couldn't agree more. You know, uh, the city is, you know, living housing costs in the city, I think, is something every New Yorker talks about all the time, right? It's a kind of on the top three things you get asked uh, if you live here, and certainly what we all talk about to our neighbors about all the time. And, you know, that's definitely true with our workforce um, and certainly something we discuss with fire and EMS um, and is top of mind for me always. You know, I, I came up, uh, you know, was raised by union leaders and, you know, believe in good union jobs. And so, you know, I'm always fighting for our members on that front um, because we want people to be able to live and raise a family here, right? Um, but I think when, you know, when it comes to the fires themselves, I, you know, that's definitely like front of mind for us is fire safety. And I think, you know, one, a, a few things I want to note there. One, there's the big picture about, you know, what you referred to about sort of enforcement and, and the really big picture of like, how do we uh, look at the city from that perspective? And then there's conversations with the community and how do we educate New Yorkers and how do we really get to people where they are um, and not just say, you know, oh, you can, you know, we're going to set these materials down and you can find them, but instead actually go speak to people where they are in the community, in the church, in their schools um, is really important to me. Um, and then I, I'll just mention we are going into the winter months. Winter months are when fires and fire deaths go up. Um, we are about to change our clocks. And I'm sure everybody has heard this phrase, but change your clocks, change your batteries. Um, I have to say it uh, anywhere I am, because that is a phrase we do think is really important for all New Yorkers, because really it's about having a working smoke alarm. It is the single greatest thing you can do to keep your family safe. Um, and so we really emphasize, re emphasize that over and over as we go into these winter months. Um, so talking about sort of the big systemic pieces, um, you know, when it comes to enforcement after the tragic fire in the Bronx last year in Twin Parks, uh, Mayor Adams issued an executive order that really increased data sharing between uh, us and HPD. And that was really, really significant and really helpful for us in understanding where is the greatest risk uh, and therefore, which building should we really prioritize looking at from an inspectional point of view? Um, that's always something we're looking at is, you know, what is the risk of a building? You know, older housing stock always, 
at greater risk uh, of a fire, certain neighborhoods are at greater risk of a fire. And so, you know, the more data we have, the, the better we can understand where to, where to flood um, our resources in making sure that buildings are safe. Um, we also formed a partnership following that fire with DOE. Uh, I think this is incredibly important um, because, you know, not only uh, are kids such uh, sort of like rich sponges of information, but they are often for um, certainly the community in the Bronx that we're referring to. In many communities in New York where they're first generation, they are often the connective link between the city and the parents, right? You know, kids are often the ones who are doing the translating. They come home from school and they, they talk about what they learned in school. And so to us, you know, really getting to kids at a certain age about fire safety is really important. You know, the reason that we all kind of know things like calling 911 or stop, drop and roll is it was said to us so early that it became muscle memory, right? We don't even remember learning it. And so our goal for some of our basic fire safety tips is to make that the same thing so that every New Yorker by, you know, by the time they're uh, you know, our age can just recall that in any emergency at any time that they think about it regularly. So we formed a partnership with DOE where we're going into the schools consistently and doing fire safety education. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, my work has always been community based. And so that's how I approach fire safety education. We have a clergy council now that we stood up here at the fire department. Um, we work directly with our elected officials, you know, extensively community based organizations and the mayor's community affairs office to make sure that we are actually getting fire safety literature where people are actually gonna see it in the languages um, that they speak in all the different uh, boroughs and, and communities in the city. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I read this powerful piece you wrote, I think in the Daily Beast, and you talked a lot about like what a family the FDNY is and kind of the, and, and the, you know, this great line you wrote, which you know well, that um, firefighters laugh at death, but cry at birthdays. And it's a bit about how, like you mentioned, first to get on the dance floor, like, 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 and, and, the, and the passion and affection that as a family, the members of the FDNY have for each other. Um, uh, it, it sounds very like a very strong culture. At the same time, you're working to change that culture uh, to grow the diver diversity uh, of, of, of the team add more women, which is growing still as a, as a low numbers up father of three little girls. I'm, I'm very passionate about that. And so but I want to ask like, how, how hard is it to do that? Like, is it, it you know, it, it seems like so much of the success is part of this tradition that just feels so strong and powerful that you exalt. And at the same time, it feels like it has to grow. Yeah, you know, diversity and tradition can and do exist uh, side by side in this department, and it's not one or the other; it's both. Um, and it, in fact, it always has been. You know, if, if you look at the fire department, while we are an incredibly um, close traditional family, we have always evolved and changed. Um, as, and you know, as all organizations do, and all cities do. Um, you know, I'd also say, like a family, we yes are very close, which means we both you know love and fight like a family. And so certainly. You know, we're always having discussions about the changes here, but they are, uh, they're always discussions. You know, I have a firm belief that you should always be able to sit at a table and break bread with anyone. Um, that's the sort of leadership style that I bring. Um, that's what I've done over the last few years. That's what I'll continue to bring. So, you know, I think that, you know, what you said, or, or I guess what I wrote that you just uh, repeated back to me is so true. Um, but, you know, it, it comes from a very, raw place, which is that, you know, that, and I've learned this from them, that they see so much tragedy, you have to find, you have to appreciate joy when it's there, um, you know, because you just never know what's going to happen. Um, and they have a very raw understanding of that because of what they do. So, you know, certainly they are always, uh, I think, just trying to appreciate each moment as they have it, it's something that they really taught me. Um, and I think that, you know, community is so, so important. I believe we can do anything, truly anything. And, you know, anything great that has been done in this department and in this city has been done as a community. You know, you don't see great things happen without those sort of close knit uh, bonds and ties. So, you know, we have them here and that is actually why I know and have the belief that these two things um, can, can happen together. 
Thank you. And I'd like to stay on that a little bit. Thank you, Stephen, for that segue. I um, want to talk more about you, Commissioner Kavanaugh. <laughs> um, you know, I hate to, 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 to state the obvious, right? But, you know, you are the first woman to lead the FDNY, right? This is an incredible moment um, for the department, for our city, for women, um, you know, extremely proud of this. Um, and this is an incredible achievement for you. I'd love to hear more about sort of your leadership style. Um, you know, you sort of you just talked a little bit about the culture of the FDNY, of this sort of strong family, um, uh, 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 unit, um, but you know it, it's it's obvious that the the mayor trusts you uh, to appoint to full commissioner, and that's probably because you know the rank and file trusts you, the union trusts you. Um, but it's a it's a transition for the department, so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about sort of um, your leadership strategy, um, and you know using based on your experience and your future hopes for the department and all that great stuff. Sure. Well, um, you know, probably like many people, I don't love talking about myself, but I'll do my best. Uh, I, I prefer to talk about the department, but um, I guess what I'd say, you know, it's hard to summarize how uh, honored I feel by being appointed here. It is hard to summarize, um, you know, being the first. I don't think that has fully sunk in. Um, I certainly, you know, I, I think something else I said uh, when I was appointed that this only matters to me if I'm not the last, um, that could not be more true for me. And, and I don't just mean for women. Um, I want, there are so many firsts to be made and this is the city to make them in and this is the administration to make them. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's so important to me is, you know, developing future leaders um, and really inspiring anyone to feel that that they can do this um, or or they can be the first in you know whatever realm that they are in um, and that they can have a seat at the table and that hopefully they feel um, my seat at the table can be theirs. So you know that's that is a cornerstone of my belief, you know, and I would say that that really has a lot to do with the way that I was raised. Um, I, I was raised with you know really truly a village. Um, you know it wasn't just family, it was friends that had became family. Um, it was people with incredibly diverse um, backgrounds and viewpoints who could always come together to for the greater good. Um, and so, you know, that I think is why I have such a belief in it is I was raised that way. I've seen it firsthand. You know, I know in, in kind of these political times, it can feel like that is not true if you watch the news, um, but it, it is true in my life. Um, and I, I bring that, I think, to leadership very much. And like, you know, like I said earlier, I will sit and have a conversation with anyone because I enjoy that. I think getting to know people where they are and knowing what moves them, you know, what they worry about every night um, is really, you will find generally at the end of the day that you have far more in common than you do uh, difference. Um, and so that's, you know, a leadership style that I bring. Um, and certainly, you know, like I said, you know, I've always been community-based. That, that goes for the, the are my members too. You know, to me, it's, I work for them. And so always trying to have a consistent conversation with them, a feedback loop. You know, I go out to EMS stations and firehouses and I say, how am I doing? Um, how are we doing? How are you doing? And I think that's really important because, you know, for any of us who run a really large organization, which so many people on this call do, things can really sound and look good when you're sitting in your office talking about it, but they don't always work for the end user. Um, and that's especially true. You know, my end users are, you know, in someone's apartment at 4 a.m. doing CPR. They are, uh, you know, underground in the subway putting out a fire. You know, they're in these really unusual and extraordinary circumstances. And so I think having a constant conversation is really essential for, for me and for us as leaders to understand that what we're talking about um, is really happening out there in the field. Can I ask, Mr. Has that answer changed um, in as, in the arc of you know since you you've been at the FDNY? You talk about going out. Like, um, are they are, are the concerns and the um, of, of 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 the members of the FDNY changed a lot in the last few years, either since the pandemic started or or since or before that? Well, yeah, certainly um, at the height of the pandemic, when I was speaking to our members. You know, those concerns uh, were very specific uh, to that moment. Um, and certainly, I think that you do, you know, we, 
I'd say one that has always been top of mind, but is now more so following the pandemic is the health and welfare of our, of our own members and particularly mental health. Um, you know, it's obviously, as I think many of you know, uh, it's one of the things that we do as an agency. We have a special response ambulance for mental health calls. So there's a piece of our you know, policy that is about uh, the mental health of New Yorkers, but also we have massively expanded our own uh, counseling services unit because, you know, we, or, you know, I saw I, our members, I would go to talk to them at the height of the pandemic and, you know, to understand for someone whose job it is to save a life and is usually getting to do that in any given day to see so much loss day in, day out of not only on their calls, but also in their own workforce and their own family um, is just the kind of thing that I knew we would need to be accounting for for a very long time. Um, and so I'd say that is probably one of the biggest, I don't want to say change. We've always talked about mental health in the fire department, but certainly um, one of the the pivots we have made is to really think about the long-term impact that um, responding to COVID had on our members. And can I ask this one follow-up to that? Um, you talk about, you know, the loss of life around um, the people do what you do. Um, the people you work with run into fires. You have, I assume you have not done that. Um, has that been a barrier? Because a lot of the people who have led the FDOI in the past have been people who really like, you know, run, in, run into fires to save people. Yeah, you know, I'm not the first civilian commissioner. And I think that I bring what, um, you know, a civilian commissioner it brings to the table, which is I am, uh, you know, a fierce advocate and a fierce operator of, you know, uh, problems and large scale opportunities. So it is my job to go hear from our members, what do they need, and then go fight for it. Um, figure out how do we get it done? Who do we need to talk to about it? Um, and especially that question of, you know, how do we prepare for the next five or 10 years? Um, I think that is the role of the commissioner is to think about, you know, what's happening today and what's happening five years from now and how do we get from here to there? And I think that's what I've spent my career doing. So for me, you know, I think I've, I'm doing what I've been doing for a couple of decades. Um, I'm just doing it for the world's greatest fire department, not that I'm biased. I love it. Um, so I'll just jump to some of the questions in the chat and in a more general way. Um, you know, over the last few years, we've heard about some of the difficulties and challenges in the city uh, in terms of hiring vacancies. I mean, I think it's a workforce development issue that we're seeing across the board in the private sector and the public sector as the way people work have changed, um, concerns around health have changed. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in talking to you or hearing from you uh, a little bit about sort of the strategies to incentivize folks to come on. I mean, I know there are certain pos positions that might not have the highest uh, uh, pay rate um, and they do some very important jobs that, you know, required to, that's required to keep the city moving, whether it's inspections or other types of things. But could you talk a little bit about the challenges in hiring, uh, filling vacancies or new roles as you, as you think innovatively? Uh, around yeah. and ways that you think you might creatively combat some of that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, yes, just like you said, you know, we're facing the same challenges as the private sector. And, you know, certainly that's one of the things I sort of learned in my conversations. I thought this was a uh, sort of unique to government. And when I sat down with my friends uh, in the private sector, they said the same thing. And so, you know, I said, you're stealing my people. <laughs> and they said, no, we're not. We can't, we, we aren't able to hire them either. And so, you know, that, uh, it certainly means it's an even larger challenge than we realized, but it also meant that I understood that that was a challenge that we were, we could kind of puzzle through together, um, which made me feel a little bit better, you know, that it wasn't just that people were shifting away from government, which, you know, I, I love so much and wouldn't want to see. Um, so we're really approaching it as a city. Um, there's actually a few things that have rolled out over the last few days um, you know, uh, from the mayor's office, one of them yesterday. Uh, from the law department, a new way to encourage more lawyers to get into the city of New York. So I think we we definitely are trying to take a new look at this. I think just like you guys, we, we're all trying to figure out what is happening with the workforce and what are the needs and ways that we can address it. And I'm not sure that I've, I certainly haven't spoken to anyone who knows 
the answer. Um, but I do know that it is something that is top of mind for all of us. Um, and there are a couple of working groups that we have across agencies discussing these exact issues. You know, where, where are the positions that we're really seeing the drop off? Um, what can we do to restructure those positions or rethink um, the way that we hire? And then where, you know, where are we going in the future? And, you know, to what extent do we share those pain points with the private sector, right? Is it about cultivating more workers early on? Is it about a pipeline when kids are in school? Or is it about adjusting, uh, you know, a salary structure or a way of working for a particular title? So we're taking a look at all of those. I would love to keep talking uh, to you and your members about it because I think it is a challenge we face, um, not just as a government or a city, but actually, you know, sort of as a country, there's clearly a change happening that we're all trying to, to get to understand what it is. And if I can just follow up, and this is actually another question in the chat, but we've sort of discussed this on the call with Chief Correo and talk in talking about sort of um, inspections and in creative ways we can um, expedite those processes. Has there been any thought around or further thought around using third party um, certified uh, companies to um, to do sort of operations that FDNY uh, employees might do when it comes to uh, final inspections for fire systems and other types of inspections? Yeah, so, you know, we are always looking at all of the options. I will say that we, we would never look at an option that would replace uh, an employee, but, you know, those employees have um, you know, special experience specifically around safety. Um, and that's really what they are there to do is to ensure that the building is safe for the folks that are going into it. Um, but certainly, you know, we're looking at every single option um, that we can to see which things, like uh, we talked about at the beginning of this, it's not one or the other, which things can be both efficient uh, and safe. And so, you know, certainly as we uh, explore some of those, we can, we can come back and talk to you about which we, things we think can accomplish both, be more efficient and safe. Sure, and you know, just, I, I think I feel comfortable speaking on behalf of many of our members, you know, we are eager to help our members and the private sector wants to work with the public sector, including the FDNY. So if there's ways that we can work together um, to come up with some of these solutions, I think we're on board. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you, you spoke to Chief Correo and um, we'll continue those conversations, but you know, one of the things we've spoken a lot about is that um, there are definitely, once communications Im improves, there are a lot of ways in which we can help you be better prepared by the time you get to us so that the process is faster from there. And I think certainly you found some of those in your first conversations with him where, um, you know, things that we might have both thought uh, were an unsolvable problem were actually just a communication issue that if you better understood um, how to prepare plans for us. Um, they would be they would be better when they got to us and we would move more quickly through our process. And so we're going to keep doing that. We want that to be a constant feedback loop where both you can educate us and we can educate your members. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, you talked about embracing technology. Um, technology at scale isn't cheap. And um, the mayor's made a point of saying we've got to tie in our belt, which seems to be the very prudent thing to do given where the economy stands. Um, are you... How, how does how does budget affect kind of growing the embrace of technology in the in the FDMI? Yeah, you know, I, I we're all always looking to make sure we can be more efficient, and technology certainly helps with that. Um, so, you know, to the extent that, especially on the administrative end, um, in here in our headquarters, you know, if we can do things more efficiently and more effectively using technology, and that can save. Um, costs downstream, um, especially if those costs can then go to, you know, the frontline work. Uh, that's something that is a constant conversation and almost daily conversation in an agency of, of our size and, you know, always has been and always will be. We always need to be looking at our, our budget and our operations and seeing how we're doing. Can I ask that in the, like the, my, my image of a firefighter is like, you walk in very much as a person with like an ax and a hose <laughs> to solve the problem. I, I ask, is there a version that like a high tech, there's like, a, like that there's the furthering of technology that really helps them better identify fires, where they are, the risk associated with fires. Is that, is that part of the plan or is that already been implemented? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, technology is a huge part of what we do on um, the fire and EMS side. 
you know, with EMS, um, you know, we are healthcare workers, right? So think of all the ways in which healthcare has and does continue to evolve. Um, our members must uh, and do keep up with those evolutions. You know, they are using uh, drugs today to uh, when they take victims out of fires that are actually increasing the likelihood of um, fire victims surviving that fire. And those are, you know, that's the use of drugs um, that have only been developed in the last few years and rolled out um, into the field, into EMS. Um, so that innovation is, is constant uh, uh, in EMS. And then on the fire side too, you know, yes, obviously the, you know, the ax and the hose, that's all, that's true. Um, but there's a lot, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, like I spoke about at the beginning, we use risk, risk algorithms to understand which buildings are riskiest in any given neighborhood um, so that they can do inspections based on that. Um, and then they, you know, also have uh, both fire and EMS have access to smartphones and smart devices. And the reason for that is there are training videos on there. There are there is information about buildings and about incidents that they're going to walk into so that they can better understand uh, when they're on their way, you know, what what does what I'm walking into look like? What is going to be there? And that makes them safer um, and hopefully leads to uh, po more positive outcomes for the civilians. So I think we have a, a few more minutes. Um, Stephen, I don't know if you wanted to have the last. I have one. a final, I have a, I've got have a final question here as, as we're approaching time. So we, <laughs> we love public service in Abney and, um, and, and, and I, 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 I just say thank you for the service you've done. But I, I have like a very obvious question here, which is, are you gonna run for office when you're done with this? Oh, no. <laughs> nope. you, 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 Definitely you, not. <laughs> really? Because you feel like the kind of person who one would obtain elected office. And as let's say for whatever you, you, you completed your time, the FDNY would be like a great influence on our, let's say not, not different or larger governmental system. I, I'm very flattered and I appreciate that. Um, but you know, one, this is the best and most special job I could ever get and I have it um, and certainly uh, I am happy here. I also say a couple of things. One, I, I know it may not seem so, but I'm a pretty shy person um, who doesn't act, was not actually very comfortable in public speaking uh, when I began this effort. So while I've gotten there, I'm very happy to be talking to you guys. Um, public office is, is not for me. That is a 24 seven public life um, that I am very happy to support a lot of people uh, who do that. As I think many of you know, I did that early in my career. I worked on campaigns. So I know firsthand um, how hard it is to run for office and how public it is. So uh, it's a very well-informed uh, answer when I say that that's not for me, but that this is uh, the perfect job and I love it and I'm in it. And there's uh, I'm, I'm not being like the presidential candidates and being cute. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> well, I um, uh, well, first let me say whether you run or not, we're grateful. <laughs> I'm going to all say never say never, <laughs> and um, and 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 really just um, thank you. Uh, we can't overstate how important the job that you do is to the citizens of New York, and it's not always appreciated every moment um, because it's the kind of thing that's just always there. And so I just really want to say how grateful we are, and that if we can be helpful. As things come up, please come to our community. We want to be supportive. Absolutely, I would really, I'd really love to. I really mean that. Um, anytime I can talk or visit, please reach out. I'd love to. Yes, we would love to have you back in the future. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm Thank in. You so much, Commissioner. Thank you, guys. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you. you too.